Thank you everybody for coming out today. My name is Chris Hazley. I live in downtown right around the corner on College Street. I serve on the Church Street Marketplace Commission. Uh, the idea for today's event kind of came about after a chance meeting with Chief Murad and I. I think it was after the Charter Change Committee a few weeks ago. Kind of took some inspiration from the South End sit down that some of the counselors had done there. So the idea was just to basically uh, have the Chief come in and create an opportunity for community members, people who live and work in downtown, to just have an opportunity to interact with the Chief and get some information about what's going on in downtown and what the BPD is uh, doing to address some of the issues that we've seen. So the Chief will be uh, starting with a PowerPoint to kind of give an overview of what's been happening here and then we'll have some time for Q&A. <laughs> Without further ado, Chief John Murad. Thank you, um, and thank you everybody for, for being here this afternoon and for, for you know being involved and invested in this community. It, it's not going to uh, continue to be the great place that it is without that kind of involvement and investment. Um, so uh, Chris asked me to produce a, a PowerPoint. He had some specific asks for it, and so those are going to be in here, as well as some sort of baseline setting. For anyone who sees the regular police commission meeting, which we hold monthly, or reads the chief's reports that I publish for that uh, monthly police commission meeting, some of this will be redundant. So I'll try to move through some of it quickly, uh, but I encourage anyone to you know, ask questions if you have them, and, and, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, slide, please. So that was a photo on the front, of course, of the 4th of July. We had a great 3rd of July uh, here. That's uh, the mayor um, addressing our roll call. It was, for us, a, a full house roll call, all of the folks that we've got available. Um, you see some of them there uh, at the bottom of Church Street um, and uh, some fireworks there, too, as well. Next, please. This is the biggest issue in front of us. The two biggest issues we have are staffing and call volume. Those are the things that are the teeter-totter on which we seek balance. Uh, our head count is uh, much lower than it has been in the past, drastically lower. Um, this document is a picture of every first of the month head count and how it bounces up and down over the years uh, and uh, where we currently are. Next, please. This is a picture of where those 66 officers that we have are currently assigned, how they are distributed. Um, and it includes the fact that uh, several of them are not available for patrol. That means that they're not effective. That's because one, uh, we have two currently on maternity leave. Uh, we have an officer on a long-term military assignment. We have officers who are new hires and are in field training and therefore are not independent officers. We don't consider them effective in the sense that they can't be sent and deployed on their own. Uh, that gets us to 50 there are 14 supervisors. Uh, that includes sergeants and lieutenants and the deputy chiefs and myself. There are 10 detectives who are assigned to our detective unit. One of them is in the DEA task force. Two of them are at the Chittenden unit for special investigations that involves uh, and investigates sex crimes or crimes against the very old or the very young. Um, and so those 10 detectives are not part of our patrol force. We have seven officers at the airport that have to be assigned to the airport. Uh, technically, it is six officers and two officers who work there half a shift over the midnights because we have curtailed our presence at the airport significantly. We ignore we normally had eight officers at the airport, and that's really the minimum that it needs to, to have. We've gone below the minimum in order to keep it, uh, try to service what our core needs are on patrol. We have one special assignment officer, that is our recruitment officer. Uh, we absolutely need that because if we can't grow, then we are sunk. But we used to have two additional special ass assignment officers, one who was attached to the drug unit, a police officer working with the detectives. It was an opportunity for career path growth and offered an opportunity to augment that very important unit. We know that drugs are a significant component of the crimes and conditions that we see in the city. And we also had an officer who was assigned as a domestic violence prevention officer or DVPO. Both of those officers had to be returned to patrol this summer because we are simply uh, too low and we had some, uh, some changes in staffing that made that necessary. I hope to be able to put both of them back into their special assignments by October. Um, we are authorized for 87 sworn officers. We used to be authorized for 105. Of the 87, we employ 66. Of the 66, 58 are effective. And we also have community service officers. That is a position we always had, but we have recently uh, expanded it significantly. And community support liaisons, which is a role that we created in uh, 2020 two as, excuse me, 2021, as part of something called the Public Safety Continuity Plan. As our headcount, sworn officer headcount plummeted, we knew that we had to create other kinds of resources. We have five community service officers and five 
community support liaisons. Next slide, please. This talks a little bit more about those roles, those roles that are unique to the Burlington Police Department. Uh, CSOs, as I said, are something we always had, but we only had two of them. We're currently authorized for 11, but we have five. Uh, we are uh, seeing it as a great opportunity to step up to police officers. Five of our current police officers were CSOs first. They came aboard as CSOs. They get to learn the department, the city, the radio, a little bit about what police do. But CSOs are not police. Community service officers can cannot uh, make arrests, they cannot use force, they cannot compel anyone to do anything. They can issue a ticket, a municipal ticket, if the person to whom they are issuing it accepts it. But if that person doesn't want it, there's nothing the CSO can do to force the, the person to take that ticket. Um, they are uh, effective in the sense that they are a presence, and it's great to see them out and about, but what they can do is limited by law and by training. Um, the CSLs are in-house social workers. This is an entirely new role that I invented along with the uh, assistant director of what we call CAPE. Our CAPE division is a new part of the police department that we created uh, called Crisis Advocacy Intervention Programs. Um, Lacey Smith is the AD CAPE. She had a role similar to the CSL role uh, from about the mid-2010s. And I thought Lacey was amazing. I thought Lacey, I wished I could clone Lacey. Uh, she and I worked to create a, a role that was essentially like what she was doing, except expanded in number. And we are all allotted six CSLs. We currently have five, and we have one in background right now. So we'll have six again very soon. Next, please. We have had to implement something called a priority response plan because of this diminishment of officers. What, when I showed you that we have uh, 20, I think the number is 24 right now, or 26 police officers on patrol, uh, normally we had 52. We used to have 52 non-supervisory sworn police officers on patrol. So that's not the sergeants, that's just the officers. We now have 26. You cannot answer as many calls for service with 26 as you can with 52. And so we have had to create a system whereby we answer the ones that are the most important, or the most, uh, that have the most uh, considerations around life safety, and that is this. Um, the incidents that are dark blue are priority ones. They are things that we must go to. The, the light blue incidents can go in either direction to priority three or priority one, but they are usually bumped up to priority one. And the whites are priority threes. They're things that we just are not going to go to if we don't have officers available at a given moment. And unfortunately, some of those are really important to how a community feels and thrives, including drugs, drugs possession, and drug sale. Those are priority three. Because unfortunately, when somebody is doing, uh, is conducting drug activity, uh, showing signs of substance use disorder, shooting up in public, that is not a life safety event for anybody but that individual. <coughs> But it is a life safety event for our community. I know that. And I deeply regret that we've had to create this and that we are not as responsive as we used to be. The problems that we are seeing are problems that we didn't see as much of because they were responded to much more quickly, uh, you know, five to six years ago. The incidents that are in orange are online reports. Uh, we got into a habit of putting things that should not have been put online, online, like retail theft and larcenies. <coughs> You'll notice that those, and I know that none of you can read this, I can barely read it these days without <laughs> reading glasses, but all of these incidents, these 133 categories of incident, uh, among them are retail theft, among them are larceny from a building, larceny uh, from a motor vehicle. Those are all priority threes, but they are also uh, not online reports. And we got in a bad habit of taking them as online reports, allowing retailers to go and put them online. And we ended up with a tremendous backlog, which is some of the specific data Chris asked about, and I'll get to that very soon. Other incidents here are CSOs only. Those are the ones that have yellow next to them. That includes, for example, an ac a, cra a car crash without an injury or with a low level of property damage. The higher the injury, or if there, excuse me, the higher the property damage, or if there is an injury, it has to be an officer responding by law. But a CSO can take that report if those other other factors are not present. And so we, we have CSOs do that. CSOs also handle animal complaints. They handle noise complaints now. Um, and the officers were clear, uh, you know, a lot of this involves union negotiation. As we removed certain tasks or gave certain tasks to other entities, unions necessarily say that's not cool. Uh, try, you know, my wife was, a, was a, an actress for a long time, a professional actress on stage. Um, and if you go to a Broadway show and attempt to have a non-Ayatsi guy hang a 
the light, people are going to actually f blow a gasket, uh, maybe that exact light. Um, but uh, you cannot do that. So uh, we have the same issues. Uh, as we ch tried to move certain kinds of response into other kinds of roles in a safe way, for a noise complaint, for example, the union had a say about that as well. So now I cannot send a police officer to a noise complaint. I can only send a CSO, and that is something of a detriment. Um, next slide, please. This is how the priority response plan works. There are five police officers on any given shift, unfortunately, and on midnights we only have two. When there are five officers on the shift, we and none of them is currently involved in an incident, we go to any incident that comes up, priority one, two, or three. So you'll see there, one of those officers goes off to a retail theft in the image on the bottom left-hand corner. Well, that leaves us with four. Now a domestic assault occurs. We always send at least two officers to a domestic assault and a supervisor has to go check on the incident as well. So two of those officers split off to go to that domestic assault, leaving us with two officers available. Those two officers get a call for a larceny from a building. They're not gonna go to that. They get a call for a vandalism. They're not going to go to that. They are waiting until an incident comes up that does need a two officer priority one response and then they will respond. Now, if the retail theft officer who was deployed first finishes her task before the, you know, then, okay, now we have three available again. Somebody can go to that larceny from a building. We're not just waiting around for the robbery to happen. But we are going to maintain two officers available at any given time in order to have that response for priority one type incidents. Next, please. This is incident volume, uh, and it's year to date, so as of the, the 15th of uh, July. And you'll see that you know, we had this very deep lull around the time of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, but we have steadily climbed since then, and we are now higher than we have been at any year since uh, 2019. In fact, since 2018, we're higher than 2019. Um, next, please. These are selected incidents that you can see in the Chief's report. I, I track them uh, each uh, month over month. Uh, it's a big table. We can move quick through that. Next, please. This is aggregated larceny, and I think the visual is a little bit easier for us to see. Aggregated larceny is larceny from a person, larceny from a building, larceny from a motor vehicle, and larceny other. And you can see, uh, it, I, what, what I do normally is I compare the five years previous to the current year. I think that gives a good sense of what people sort of remember in their bones, what the last five years were like, as opposed to something that was longer ago. Um, but the last five years uh, were, you know, 18, 19, 20. Those are, are down. 21 started to rise, and 22 and 23 have been absolutely crazy with regard to the rise in aggregated larcenies. Now, these are our calls for service. So this means that a person reported a larceny. It doesn't mean that we confirmed that a larceny happened. It doesn't mean that we arrested a person for larceny. It means that a person reported a larceny and that when the officers responded, there was enough there that they didn't recategorize it to something else. This wasn't a larceny. This was merely a, a, a vandalism or you know somebody broke into your car, but it's not a larceny from a vehicle because you can't tell me that anything was stolen from the vehicle. An officer might recategorize that. But this is uh, uh, these are the ones that actually stay as larcenies. Next, please. Retail theft went even higher than larceny in 2023. So this is data through the end of 2023. Technically, it's through the 12th of December last year, but it's pretty much 2023. And you can see that is very, very different. But the next slide is going to show us a little bit of why. It is nevertheless 235% higher than the five-year average 2023 was. There's good news in this year's year-to-date data, but let's take a look first at the next slide which shows us where these retail thefts were happening. Next, please. You'll see there that the big line that goes crazy up to the top is what we would call E area, or the south end of town. This is the box stores, primarily the box stores in the Shelburne Shopping Plaza on Shelburne Road. It is not D area, which is the downtown. And uh, what we see here is that the real, uh, the, the real spike happened in the south end. Part of that is reporting. It became, it, they, it became very easy for entities to report online, and we didn't even realize some of those reports were coming in because we were so backlogged on our online reporting. We have uh, we've changed that a little bit. I want accurate data. I don't want people not to report. Um, and I have concerns around some of these categories with regard to how accurate the data is because I don't know whether people are still reporting because I know that people are frustrated by our lack of response. Next, please. 
These are retail theft trends, uh, and I'm looking here at the five-year average, and so we can see this is year-to-date for both categories. Citywide retail theft is on the left. You see that huge spike, similar to the one that you saw in the two previous two slides. And then you also see D area retail theft on the left, excuse me, on the right. My apologies. The citywide is on the left, uh, D area is on the right. And you'll see a big decrease. That is a significant decrease year to date. I am happy about that. I'm encouraged by that, but I don't know how much of it may stem from a lack of reporting. I know that there are retailers on the marketplace who, who absolutely don't report, some of them by policy. It's a policy choice by the corporations that own those stores. That is not true of the stores who are uh, owned by you know locals. Um, and a lot of our Church Street stores are locally owned. They have thin margins of, of business. Um, they are not deep-pocketed uh, international corporations. And they feel these crimes really keenly. Next, please. So here's the exact same data from the previous slides. Uh, as I said, I usually do it in previous five years. But I do want to, to, to talk a little bit about how we feel as a community. Um, and, and I do think the five-year window is, is, the most, uh, is the most relevant to how we feel. But if we go a little farther back than five years, and if you just click, you'll see that the changes are a little different when we look at a 10-year picture. Now, on the citywide retail theft year-to-date, which is on the uh, left, you'll see that the D area was responsible for most of it until E area started reporting in 2023. So that huge takeoff in 2023 is not seen in the D area data because it's really just the E area data. That is the, down, the, the south end of town. But back before that huge spike, which is so big that it kind of throws off the proportions, you'll see that, that when D area held a, felt a spike in 2016, that was driving the entire citywide retail theft numbers as well in 2016. D area's decline, or it was relatively flat from 22 to 23, and it's declined in 24, that gets eaten up in the citywide data because of the huge amount of data that's coming from the E area. What do I mean by this? In part, I mean that although I am not trying to minimize what is happening on the marketplace, I also want to put in context where we are and where we're not in the sense that this is the most dire kind of place we have ever been. I do think that it's different. I don't think that it's good, but I do think that we should think about uh, context. Next, please. These are five-year trends versus this year's year-to-date for disorderly conduct in the upper left-hand corner, uh, drugs in the lower left-hand corner, uh, trespass in the upper right-hand corner, and uh, arrest on warrant and violation of conditions of release in the lower right-hand corner. So those are arrests. The others are not. Just because it says a trespass doesn't mean an arrest was necessarily made. It could be a report of trespass. Same for disorderly conduct. Um, drugs often are not going to have any arrest associated with them. They are almost always going to be reports of drug activity and not really arrest. We don't make very many arrests for open air drug use or possession. Uh, the courts won't take them as cases, and so at best we end up with a with an arrest there. We focus on interdiction and narcotics work with our drug unit, trying to find the people who deal. Um, but that has limited efficacy. We know that it, discouraging open air drug use is integral to making certain that we get less of it. Um, if you see the last, the, uh, the last picture I think is a really important one because it has to do with arrests, especially arrests on violation of conditions of release. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Next slide, please. So here are again some ideas of the, the longer view and how it affects things. Can you click please? So that was drugs, which seems to have spiked since 2019. But if you look at the reports that we used to see in 2016, you'll see that it, it has been higher than it is this year. Um, again, I, I still don't know how much reporting is affecting this and whether people are, are exhausted about reporting and frustrated and not making reports. But we have seen higher numbers on drug activity. I will say, however, that in 2016, when you arrested somebody for using drugs in public, that person went to court. And that is not something that happens so much any longer. Next, please. Trespass 2. So here again, trespass from 2019. It looks like it's really dropped off. It has. Uh, but if we click again, you'll see that there have been you know, longer trespass. Now, this has to do a lot with ordinances. And uh, there was, for a while, a much stricter 
uh, trespass ordinance that ultimately the city was uh, was sued for. The city backed off of it. This is not just trespass from private businesses or private establishments. This is also trespass in public places like parks and City Hall Park and the marketplace. And the officers had more tools at their disposal. Some of those tools were determined to be improper. There was a lack of due process for how some of those tools worked. And so you'll see a drop off in the rate of trespass issuance during that time. Next, please. So this is arrest on warrant or violation of conditions of release. This is one where I think when we do click and see the next 10 year, you know, the full 10 year picture as opposed to the five year picture, you'll see that there is a tremendous change. There isn't a lot of additional context to this one historically. Uh, if you'll click, please. So we have seen a massive spike in violation of conditions of release and arrest on warrants. Why is that? That is because the courts closed during the pandemic. They remained closed far too long for almost two years. And as a result, we ended up with a lot of people who, in lieu of being taken to jail, they were instead given conditions of release. I'm not going to jail you, but don't do this again. And then they were uh, told that, you know, you do, they were given extended court dates, court dates that were pushed out, court dates that, weren't ha that didn't happen at all. And when they violate the conditions of release, uh, a warrant will be issued, uh, and they will be, especially if they don't appear, if they're expected to appear at court, a warrant will be issued for them. Um, and then uh, when they are arrested for that warrant or for conditions of release, they're supposed to have some kind of outcome that prevents them or discourages them from doing the same again. That is not happening. We are seeing again and again people arrested with conditions of release that they violated already. And we are, when reporting it to the court, being told, oh, just, just cite them and release them again with the same conditions. Or, at times, uh, change the conditions because they clearly couldn't meet those conditions. So uh, if, if not being able to be not intoxicated during the day is too difficult for the person, we we're going to strike that condition and then release them again, and they're no longer not allowed to be intoxicated during the day. Next page, please. This is uh, the conditions of release around the state. So every single county, and it talks about uh, the, the uh, number that received alternative disposition or were dismissed, the number that were guilty, the number that were not prosecuted and or dismissed, and the percentage at the end there. And Chittenden County finds only 7% of dispositions for charges of violation of conditions of release guilty and dismisses 92%. It is more than any other county. Uh, and this is part of the reason that we see huge numbers of folks out on the street. Next, please. The next question Chris asked was, how is the BPD working to respond to these, and how should private citizens respond, and whom should they call? So the next two slides are going to talk a little bit about who the call part, and then the responding part will follow. Next slide, please. This is an, e this is an emergency call center, ECC, call intake. And uh, I think it's important for folks to realize how, how, how busy our dispatchers are. When you call either direct to our dispatch center or to 911, which is, a, is called a public safety answering point or a PSAP, when you call 911, you're not getting our dispatch center. You're getting usually the Williston State Police Barracks. Sometimes not there. Sometimes if the Williston Police Barracks is completely swamped by calls, it'll bounce to another barracks, or it might even bounce to the other side of the lake, and you get a, a New York uh, 911 center and PSAP. They will then send the call to us and we will then take additional information. It make, it's frustrating for callers, because a lot of times callers give the same information twice. And, and that can be challenging. But it is how the system works everywhere. There are PSAPs, and then there are dispatch centers. Um, in some places, large municipalities, those two things sit in the same space. But it's never the same person who's taking the 911 call and doing the dispatch. There's always a trade-off there unless there's a direct call to a dispatch center. And we get those at times, too. But it is better for us to have those calls go through 911 than it is direct to dispatch. And there's a very lengthy phone tree, and it's easier for the caller to go through 911. It's going to be a quicker response, even if it may be a longer process. Um, so these are all sorts of things. And, and this will be public so that you can look at it and not have to try to see it on this screen where I can't even read the things. Uh, next slide, please. These are all the things that have to happen on an emergent police call that the dispatcher has to send the appropriate number of units, has to provide information to the officers, has to make a number of decisions around uh, each call. Am I going to continue with this call? Do I need certain kinds of information? What do I need? Um, and then they provide huge amounts of information to the officers even after they have no longer, they're no longer speaking to the caller. It's a lot of work. 
Um, and I, I say this merely to uh, to lend a little bit of context to the fact that I know people sometimes feel the dispatchers are either curt or are not sufficiently responsive. But I think a good component of that, if, if there is rudeness, that is unacceptable. And if we look back at, a, at an audio and listen to a call and, and hear that dispatcher being rude or saying things that are inappropriate, discipline will occur. We had a dispatcher a year plus ago who, who essentially said, we were defunded, we're not sending anybody. That dispatcher no longer works for the police department. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, I take that very seriously. But if I hear a dispatcher who is being professional, but perhaps not as solicitous as he or she might be, uh, that is a different matter. These are busy people who are working in a high stress environment and they are often trying to process a lot of things at the same time. And callers sometimes want a degree of comfort that they are not gonna get from 911. If, the, if there's professional response, and if the ultimate concern of the caller is that nobody came to my call, that is where we are right now, that sometimes we can't send anybody to these calls. And that's unfortunate. I, it, it is unacceptable in a different way than rudeness. Rudeness is unacceptable in a way that needs to have discipline and accountability immediately. If it is reported to us and we listen back and find that kind of tone from, the, from our employee. But unacceptable of not being able to respond to everything the way we once did, that is, is just where we are with regard to the headcount situation. Next, please. So what are we doing to try to fix that? And here is our recruitment and retention update. This is the most recent police academy graduation. It took place in the first of, uh, the last day of May. That officer dead center is, uh, was our, our sole attendee at this police academy and, and graduated. Next, please. We are working very hard to rebuild. And two of the most important parts of that are our recruitment officer, Carolyn Irwin. She is a sworn police officer and a corporal. And then our recruitment coordinator, Anhad Bajwa. You can see Anhad in two of those photographs. Uh, uh, and she is working with Carolyn. They do job fairs. They do social media. They do paid advertising. They do online recruiting. In 2023, last year, calendar year 23, we hired 15 sworn police officers, which is the most in more than two, probably three decades. And it, is, it was a, a testament to their work. It was a tremendous amount of work. We began the year with 61, and we ended the year with 69. Now that 61 plus 15 is not 69. That's because we lose people even as we gain. That is just part of the churn. Um, <clears throat> We, in the year 23, the, of the 15, two of them were lateral police officers. That's the quickest way for us to regrow. <coughs> Excuse me, a lateral officer is an officer who's already, he's a, he or she is a police officer in another state or another municipal, municipality in Vermont, is therefore uh, more quickly able to be certified as a police officer in Vermont and for Burlington, um, and can be on the road more quickly than a recruit officer who has to go through 16 to 17 weeks of academy training, plus 580 weeks of field training, excuse me, uh, 580 hours of field training, 580 weeks, uh, 580 hours of field training. Um, we had two lateral officers and two officers who had left the BPD but chose to return in 2023 because they felt things were turning around and that the agency was in a different place and that the city was in a different place. Um, in addition to uh, hiring for uh, sworn officers, because it's not all about sworn officers, we've been hiring tremendous numbers of, emer of emergency communication specialists or dispatchers. We are allotted 14. The room fell to four in 2022. There were only four full-time dispatchers. We covered that up by forcing supervisors, sworn officer supervisors who were dispatch certified to do dispatch at tremendous rates of overtime and uh, a lot of money. It cost us a lot of money. But we also rebuilt. And we now currently have 11 dispatchers uh, with some others that are in the pipeline. And that is a big change and a big turnaround. And then finally, our dispatchers also, excuse me, our recruitment team also hires community service officers, our community support liaisons, we have records clerks, we have other professional opinion uh, positions, and all of these have to be, uh, you know, hired as well um, whenever there's a vacancy. So they do a lot of work. Next slide, please. This is some paid advertising. This actually happened to be free. We somehow ended up with a free ad in New York City's most large, uh, most read tabloid. Not necessarily my favorite tabloid, but I know that a lot of police in New York City read it. And uh, they are, uh, we're, we're able to, we did get some bites from this. Um, next, please. 
This is sworn officer pattern, uh, hiring patterns, and I know this is a table that also is too small to, to read. You'll see there that that 15 is the largest in this time frame that's shown in the table. This also shows the number of, you know, the number of the number hired, how many are still employed. Our overall retention is uh, about 38% over the past decade plus, uh, past 15 years. Um, and obviously, could we do better than that? We would like to. Uh, and uh, and we do extensive uh, exit interviews to try to determine what it is. Most of the time, it has to do with this is a really stressful profession. It has a lot of uh, of, of challenges. Um, people move on for a variety of reasons. They move on to go to other professions, to leave policing. They go to, to less vigorous police departments where it's even if the salary isn't quite as good, they also work a lot less. Um, or they move on to federal opportunities. If you are somebody who really wants to be an arrest uh, kind of police officer and go out and do that kind of work, your better bet is the feds. They get to do that and they don't have to do all the, the sort of community parts of policing. So we lose people to a variety of things like that. Next, please. These are recruits and laterals comparing, and again, I'm sorry that this table is too small to really be read, but it compares the number of recruit hires that we bring in twice a year because there are two Vermont Police Academy classes, one in February and one in August. And so we bring in batches of recruits twice a year in January and July, and it compares those numbers to the numbers of lateral hires that we've had over the years. We've improved our lateral hiring average over the last couple years because we've focused on that. Um, uh, our recruit, we did really well in 2023. 20, uh, we have not done as well in 2024. We, as I said, we had one recruit only in the class that began in February of 2024. And we are going to have four whom I, intend, I expect to onboard next week for the August Police Academy class. Four is good, but we really need more than that in order to, to meet our goals. Next, please. Again, emergency communication specialists, you know, more than, uh, they dispatch both fire and police, which is an important point. They don't just do the police department. That's more than 40,000 calls for service per year. Uh, we are, are working hard to get up to the full complement of 14. Next, please. Um, but 14, I, to put it in context, at any given time, there's two there are two officers on the police desk, excuse me, not officers, dispatchers, two dispatchers on the police desk and one dispatcher on the fire desk. Um, so when you call, that's, that's who's in that room. These are our community service officers and our hiring uh, work on those positions. Um, we have hired uh, approximately, we've hired 16 applicants since I introduced the public safety continuity plan and it was approved in February of 21. Uh, that became part of the budget for fiscal year 22 and therefore we weren't able to hire people for the position until really the very, very end of, of fiscal year 21, uh, of 20, uh, the very beginning of fiscal year 22. So we began hiring them in essentially June-ish uh, after it was approved in February, and this is what we've seen. We've had a, a, about 176 to 180 applicants now, because that's a little bit out of date. We've hired 16 of them. Five of them have gone on to become police officers. Those are the ones that are, are listed with the darker blue with the asterisks. And then five of them are current. Um, and then the, the, the Gantish chart, uh, sort of a pseudo Gantt chart, shows you each of those, officer, each of those uh, community service officers' CSO's tenure. Next, please. Our community support liaisons, a little bit more talk about them and uh, just some, some photos of them working. Incredibly important role. I am so glad to have uh, had a role in creating this with, with AD Cape Lacey Smith. Um, we would need these even if we were back to 105 uh, authorized officers and having 97. This position does not, un this doesn't answer police service, right? This doesn't answer calls for service that would otherwise be police. <laughs> CSOs can, they can answer some calls for service that otherwise would have been police. CSLs don't, but what they do is they prevent future calls by addressing situations in ways that don't require police intervention and then hopefully prevent downstream police intervention. If you can address a person who's having uh, issues around mental health, around substance use disorder, around homelessness, uh, and, and help that person in a way that, that he or she doesn't then have an episode that becomes uh, elevated to the level of a police call for service, then you're preventing calls for service. And that's tr tremendously valuable. Um, in addition to the CSLs, we work incredibly closely with street outreach. 
Uh, basically, street outreach does this does the work that patrol officers do. They're in the field. They're meeting people exactly where they are. They're on patrol during the day. CSLs are a little bit more like detective. They do they do casework. They do follow up work. They also go out and meet people, especially in the encampments where where street outreach generally won't go. Um, so a lot of work with the homeless encampments, but they are also a little bit more uh, lengthy follow-up with regard to casework in the way that detectives do work that, that patrol officers just don't have the, the time or bandwidth to do. Next, please. These are just some photos of our, our 115th graduation. Uh, we had uh, four officers that graduated from that group. Um, including a young man who'd been a, a high school, a BHS high schooler, and then a member of our Beach and Parks Patrol. He was one of the few people that we allowed to join the Beach and Parks Patrol as a senior in high school. Uh, he is Nepalese, and uh, he's now in field training as an officer. Really great to have him there. Um, we get good people. Our, uh, you'll see there one of those officers speaking in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that is uh, Officer Kim Lockerbie. Kim was selected by his fellow uh, classmates to be the president for the class. Uh, he was, he's former military, he's really put together, and he was a, a, a guiding person down there. Um, and they honored him with that selection. Next, please. Uh, this, you'll see the, the young woman walking on the left side there, Officer Maeve O'Donnell. She was the top academic recruit for the 116th class, and she had the top overall firearm score. Um, both that shooting and the academic portions of knowing when to shoot and understanding our laws and rules around use of force. Uh, and then those are the other officers that are there with her, um, uh, a good group of, of new officers. But not all of them are still with us. One of those young men, the one on the the one who's dead center, well not dead center because it's uh, it's six, but so center uh, left on the picture on the upper right hand corner, he left because he couldn't he couldn't fathom how much paperwork there was. He said there was far too much paperwork in process, and he'd been a teacher in Florida. And he moved up here to take the job, and he said, I just, it's, I, I could not imagine. We, we arrested a guy, we had videotape of him putting stolen property in the store into his backpack, and when we got back, we had to do a search warrant for the backpack, and then we also had to do a search warrant for every single part of the backpack, and I just, I, I couldn't imagine doing this work. It's too much. And he left. Um, uh, another one of those persons is now employed by UVM because our pace was too much for him and he was not really getting it through in field training. He knew he wasn't going to make it out of field training and he came and he said, you know, I, I just, I'm not going to make it through field training, I, but UVM has offered me a position and he took it. Next, please. This is the 117th graduation. Again, we had one recruit in that class. That's the young woman on the uh, on the, the right there. But she's also below participating in the flag ceremony. That's a big honor. It's indicative of, of the fact that she performed very well down there, and they let her do that role. The young man next to her is Officer Noah Hua. Uh, some of you may have seen him out. He, do, he works a lot of Church Street details um, and is out there. He was selected as the best teaching assistant by the, the basic class. Um, the, the Vermont Police Academy has like four staff members. It's incredibly understaffed, and uh, it depends on agencies to send people down there to work on, to be teachers. Um, frankly, I don't have enough officers to send to them, but I do it anyway because A, it is invigorating for the officers, gets them off the pat patrol for a day. It keeps them sharp because, the, you know, the, there's an old medical school adage, which is, uh, you know, uh, watch one, do one, teach one, and you learn most by teaching something. Um, but also, I want the way Burlington polices to be inculcated around the state. And to the extent that at the Vermont Police Academy, we meet the new officers who are going to be everywhere in, in, in Brattleboro and Bristol and Bennington, and those are just the Bs, uh, they are, we want them everywhere. And I, I believe that we do things differently here. I believe our officers are better. They certainly see far, far, far more by, by volume and variety. By volume and variety, they have more calls for service than any other entity in the state. And I, I want them to participate down there, and I'm glad they do it so well as to be honored as NOAA was. Next, please. So 
Coming additions and subtractions. So as we said, we were at 87. We're authorized for 87, but we're at uh, 66. According to this year's budget, we are able to hire up to 74, which is a reasonably ambitious number to hit by June 30th, 2025. But the mayor has made it very clear that if by some good fortune, we are able to hire to a higher number than 74, she will find the funds and the city will find those funds. Um, the in and out of hiring is a very fluid thing. I don't usually read uh, word for word from, from slides, but I think this one is important. Um, the numbers change. So today, on Thursday, the 18th, we have 66, but on Tuesday, we'll have 69. Why? Well, as I told you, I'm bringing aboard four new recruits on Monday the 22nd, and they all start at basics training, and that technically should bring us to 70, but that same day is the last day for a sergeant who is leaving because he can't do this police work anymore. It has been too intense. We are understaffed on supervisors because I can't, uh, you know, it, it's very, we, we're we have to have enough supervisors for each shift and so in some ways, I have too many supervisors based on how many officers. A one to five ratio is not an ideal ratio of supervision. One to eight is a much better ratio. But I need to have supervisors. I can't have a shift with no supervisors. But I'm understaffed on supervisors, and they've been working a lot to cover for each other. And he's just exhausted. Um, he came to me. Uh, he said... He didn't know that his marriage would stay. I mean, it was, it was, it was a really hard place for him to be. And it was, uh, he's, he's leaving the state and, and leaving the profession. Um, and so he will be gone. He's an he's a incredibly valuable young man. I'm, I'm incredibly sorry to lose him. That'll put us back at 69, which will mean we're exactly where we were when we began 2024. Um, and that is a real challenge for us. In addition, we have five officers who are currently eligible for retirement. They are all past 20 which means they could go at any moment. Um, I know for a fact that one of them is not. I, I've got her for another year. Uh, I know one is, is unlikely. The other three uh, are, are employees out at the airport. Um, they are not, they don't, if, I, if they were forced to come back downtown, they would uh, they'd just resign at that moment. Um, I have convinced them to, to stay on, at least in part, uh, for the time being by, by noting that the contract that the city and the city council authorized for us was a really good contract and it matured this year. So as of the 1st of July, it's a full, fully mature contract and they're making $100,000 a year now as a top pay police officer. So getting another year of that, <clears throat> of a higher salary than you were making last year and it's now beyond 20 is a really good pension boost and it's an important pension boost. They'll see a lot of that money if they stick around for another year. So I'm hopeful. But I also recognize that it doesn't take much for them to say it's not, this is, I'm tired and I'm not, this isn't worth it anymore. And we all know that in policing, we are always, you know, one bad incident away, lawful or righteous or unlawful or bad from having a lot of pressure and scrutiny on the, on, on the profession. Uh, and that would absolutely drive folks out. Um, so next page, please. This is that salary, that top pay. We are still offering a bonus, uh, and these are the, that's the, the starting pay ranges depending on experience, so we can offer laterals more. We uh, do a lot of things that other agencies don't. We will accept non-citizens. If you are here, if you're a permanent resident, you can be uh, a, uh, a green card holder. You can be a police officer in Burlington, and there are a lot of places in the country where you can't, so that's a good thing for us. Um, we uh, have a 10-hour, four-day-on, three-day-off work week for patrol. And that is something that most other agencies don't have. And that is something that really, really resonates with the officers. They, they really appreciate that <coughs> schedule. Um, and, uh, you know, we have another, a number of other, uh, you know, opportunities and, and benefits. We, I believe us to be an attractive place. Uh, it's trying to get that message out and get it in the right ears and in front of the right eyes. Uh, that is the challenge for us. And that's it. And I went on a really long time. So uh, any questions uh, since nobody interrupted during it? Thank you. It will be presented to the police commission on Tuesday and it'll be public then. It'll go up in front of them. Okay, because what I've done is I've only recorded you basically. Great, I can get it to you. But if Michelle and Chris send that to me at CCTV, you can do inserts. Yep. We'll show you, then we'll show that, and we'll show you that. We'll get, you, we'll get that to you. People know that it's available at cctv.org. Just keep track of today's date. Plug-in, search by date, cctv.org, comes right. Thank you. So, any, anything? 
I'm sorry. Uh, that's what we thought. Step up to the microphone. I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street. I appreciate this. Um, it sounds like it sounds like you do a fair amount of exit interviews when you, people leave. It sounds like there's a lot of challenges, but is there are there learning opportunities based on the exit interviews to? Make the make the force better. You know the continuous improvement aspect of a force. Have you are you are you collecting those or are they using them to try to make it e easier for people to stay on the force? Thanks for that question. Yes, we we absolutely do look at them. Um, anytime there's something about the department or about the way that we uh, operate, we make efforts to address that. Over the past several years, the bulk of them have talked about uh, support at the city level or at political levels, and we don't have a lot of control over those. Mike Bolowski with uh, uh, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Um, just a simple question. Uh, would you say the new mayor's office is being generally supportive um, now that you've got a new administration? I noticed they said they would hire new officers if you can get more. Yeah, I think that's uh, absolutely the case. We've seen, you know, there have been clear uh, expressions of, of a desire for, for full hiring on the CSO role, uh, a willingness to say, you know, if, if by some good measure of fortune we're able to get more uh, police officers, we're going to hire those police officers um, up to 87. And, you know, there was a photo that on the second slide, there's a photo of the mayor at a roll call addressing officers, um, you know, there and and uh, absolutely extending saying uh, that was the third of July I, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for you all to be here uh, you're working a holiday um, it's incredibly important and uh, I am uh, uh, you know I, 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 I'm grateful to, for that you're part of this team Hi, thank you um, I'm sorry because Charlie said I had to speak into I don't know if it's on. <laughs> a microphone Thank you. Um, I have a couple of statements. Um, regarding support, you, the department does have more control than they're willing to work on. This has been an item of great concern for some time now, even since before I joined the police commission talking about community engagement, how do we get information out to the public, to how do we get our officers out to the public to talk about what our officers are doing, what our officers are experiencing, and talking to the public so we can build the relationships in the community where we know they're not very strong. So um, respectfully, I do disagree. I believe that there are a number of things um, that can be done via uh, social media. We will have a public safety committee meeting tonight. We will have, is it Officer Mel Sergeant Mellis? Is that how we pronounce his name? Yes, yeah, so he's been doing as part of working overtime traffic enforcement in the city of Burlington. How many people knew that? All right, so we are going to have him, and he'll be talking about that, and he is community engagement gold because that's one of the things a lot of us worry about is the lack of traffic enforcement, but we've had an officer out there doing overtime just to do traffic enforcement. I have been downtown for this morning. I've been meeting with business owners and uh, people who work with business owners to combat retail theft. You need to understand that the reason you're not seeing the calls is people are literally being told not to call. That is happening. They're being told not to call. We are not coming, do not call. So you've got to go in, you've got to find out where the fail is in the, you know, once a call hits dispatch, because that is why those numbers are down, not because it's down. They are being, that is, I heard that repeatedly. So something is very wrong there. Um, mutual aid agreements, I would really like to have us discuss that. Is it possible, especially when carrying out warrants, because we know if we try to arrest someone who's on a warrant, that's going to pull officers off the street for a very long time. Can we get mutual aid for warrants? I think that is something that we need to. And I think uh, given the level of certain drug dealing that we see, people who are need to be targeted because of 
uh, the high level that they're doing, not just a little hand to hand, but the, the people bringing it in, there's too many people operating with impunity in our city. You know, they're being identified for people who are watching very closely what's going on downtown. And there is this, um, there are people who are acting separate from the department. So how do we coordinate so the department can use the information? Um, we need, two yeah, okay, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it's just two minutes, but I, I, I think that that is something that really needs to be looked at because um, we all know that's a big problem. Um, thank you, and I'll probably have a discussion later about the data. Thank you, everyone. I suggest no argument at all. I appreciate so much work that you're doing. And I um, recognize the chaos that was created, not just in this. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm Angie Chapel Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street. Um, the chaos uh, countrywide with the killing of George Floyd, and it happened in our city too. And you stepped into a fraught, a very fraught situation. Um, so first, I want to express my great appreciation for what I think is your cool-headedness throughout th throughout this. Your um, copious uh, statistics that you're able to provide, um, and it must keep you and some other people quite busy to be able to keep track of all that. Mostly me. Mostly you. Um, and so I want to say that to be critical of the police department for not doing some things is, not, is to not appreciate the complexity of all of the things that you are doing with insufficient numbers of police officers. And so I just want to state my own appreciation for what you do. I feel safe in this city. I, um, I feel safe on Church Street. I try to go to Church Street to support our city. And so thank you. That's what I can say. Well, thank you very much for that. And I'm very glad to hear you say that because I do think that I think this is a safe city. My wife, my children, we live in the city. They go out in the city. They, uh, my, my kids are both uh, very involved in lyric theater and we'll, you know, we'll be there late at night for, for rehearsals or, or put in times uh, and then we'll walk alone. I, I let my son, he and his friends walk alone and ride their bikes alone throughout the city. Um, make sure they lock their bikes, but uh, they do, uh, they do, they are safe as they move about. And I do think that this is a safe city. I do think that, you know, uh, it, it, it pains me every time I, I, I wince, every time someone tells me that they no longer come downtown or that they hear that other people won't come downtown anymore. Um, and I do want to figure out what we can do about that. Uh, you know, we, are, we, made, we made a very large narcotics uh, bust yesterday, a big operation of dealers. We are focusing on the people who are doing that kind of activity. Um, but there are, are, uh, there are challenges when you have four or five people on a shift in order to address all the things that are in front of us. We've got way too much stuff at the beer tree, the so-called colloquially beer tree that's between the Congregational Church and the Methodist Church on Buell Street. Um, and uh, although the tree itself is now fenced off, people are, are, are uh, sitting on those green belts. Um, those are the s largely the same people who were at the library, and, and we sort of moved them out of the library through attention and pressure, uh, but then they went to largely the alley that is between uh, Handy's and the Marketplace garage, and then we moved them out of that a little bit, paid a lot of attention to the garage, although not enough, uh, and, and there's still parts of the garage that you know we, we have had to close off stairwells there, um, but then they moved to the Buell Street area. We are sort of trying to get at that, but then it moves to other locations, um, there is, uh, 
you know, I, it, it is a, it's a, a challenge to keep up with where it goes. Um, and uh, it is something that is that we had a better handle on, you know, five years ago. want to get updates from the police department about the type of things that they're doing, you can get on that list. I was recently at it, and you'll get a you know press release every so often about some of the more bigger things, like the bus, for example. So uh, we had Linda here, and then we had Carrie next, and then Bob, it looks like. So thank you, Carol. Carol, all right, thank you. My name is Linda Oates, and I'm a resident owner, homeowner at Maine and St. Paul. I want to thank you, Chris, Chief, for doing this the original hotel vermont i just want to piggyback on the comments about uh it's heartening to know that what the de detectives are doing around the drugs this is my concern the the uh, just the volume uh visible volume and so i would be an advocate for even more notification public awareness of these kinds of busts to give people, to give the dealers the message that we're not so wide open for business. And also our downtown residents and the people who we want shopping downtown and feeling safe and wanting to come down to all of the events at City Hall Park. The BCA does such a great job <clears throat> pulling together, but it's the optics of um, seeing so many obvious drug deals going down and nothing is visibly changing. And on the slide, Chief, uh, that said um, the, the categories of when officers do respond to calls, did I hear this correctly, that for on-the-street drug deals, that's not presently in the category where an officer is dispatched. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, just for the, I would just ask you, encourage you and your team, if there would be a way to find ways to have some visible law enforcement presence. If they don't show up in time, show up at some point to send the message to those around who witnessed this, to give a sense that more visibility of all the work that you're doing behind the scenes help us see what you're doing so that we will have even more confidence yeah. in the activity that's being taken yeah I, you know i i am incredibly proud of the work that our narcotics detectives do um and i wish i could be i could share more of it i wish i could uh, put out photographs of, of drugs on the table but the majority of the uh, which is sort of an old policing expression of of, of, you know, drugs, you put the drugs on the table and say, look what we got. Um, and the, uh, the issue is that we, most of those cases, in order to make them, we work with our federal partners, uh, and the federal partners do not want that kind of, uh, of publicity and press release. So once we make the arrest, it becomes their, it, it's sort of, we're working with them, they're gonna be the prosecuting entity, and they are very stingy about what they want to share. Um, I do want to share more of it. Uh, I, I share as much as I can, and as Chris mentioned, if, if anyone wants to contact Sarah Tim Hernandez, our PIO, or Public Information Officer, she will add your name to our press release list, and you'll get not only press releases about incidents or, or arrests or narcotics busts, but you'll also get like this the Chief's report when it's published monthly. Um, but the amount of information that I'm able to put into discussions about busts is strictly limited by our federal partners. And then the next, I, I'm sorry, but the very next part of it was sending people. Yes, drugs, drugs uh, sales, and drugs possession are priority three calls. If we're in the priority response plan, we're not going to send an officer to that when I want to reserve that officer for a life safety event. But we do want to know about those kinds of things. They can, if, if it's made via Valcor, it will be a Valcor report. Um, that is, if you call it to 911 or dispatch. But the other way to do it is there is a button on the very top of our homepage at the city website that is drug tips. 
And there you can say, I'm seeing this activity. And if you report repeated activity in a location, it goes to the drug unit. I see every one of them as well. But the drug unit looks over all those, keeps a spreadsheet of, of the reports, and says, OK, we know we've got an issue at Pomeroy Park. OK, we know we have an issue uh, you know, at the corner of, of St. Paul and Maine. Um, and uh, we know that it, it, it is a, a, a man with, with green hair who sits at the bench on the corner and is has a car right next to him that he dips back into and out of in order to get the stuff, and that's what's <coughs> happening. That's a perfect setup for our drug unit to start looking at something like that. However, the best way to handle that, it, what we would have done before, is we had a, a unit called our street crimes team, and they were plain clothes officers who did what is colloquially called jump out work where you basically sort of you do a, a certain amount of observation on that kind of, of street level drug set. And then uh, once you, you see a certain amount of traffic, um, you, you jump out on them and, and you grab them up. And that sends a message to the community. It, it has an immediate impact on the person dealing. And it also sends a message to the dealers, uh, excuse me, the users, we're not going to this corner anymore. They're, they're on to this one. And then they find another place. But it's incredibly effective. We don't have a street crime team. And are there plans to add one? Is And where is that on the priority list? Numerically, I don't think I could field a street crime team until we're in the high 70s. I don't believe that we could make that. We have done it We've done it part-time on overtime, where we've given officers the uh, an opportunity to come in on overtime and do it. But, you know, overtime is, is, a, uh, is, is a, a drain. I mean, you can only, if you've already worked your 40 hours, you can only do so much more on overtime before you start to, have your own quality of life diminish. And even the money isn't enough to, to, to grab people in. Yeah. And, and it's also a truth that today's generation tends to value experience over money, and they tend to, to like their time off. Thank you. Um, I'm Carrie Cameron, and I serve the First United Methodist Church over on Buell Street, where the beer tree people reside. And um, I just want to say how much I appreciate what you're doing here today, Chief. And also, it's been very enlightening um, and helpful. You mentioned um, about your family not being fearful. Well, I have a full congregation and many people who use our building who are fearful, OK? And so what do we do? What do we do when, you know, um, our one of our biggest issues is the destruction to our building. And, um, you know, we're probably upwards to $50,000 now in um, vandalism. And there's no accountability for the people that are causing, you know, the destruction. And so um, I've had a knife pulled on me. I have had someone threaten to kill our entire congregation. And when we don't get police response, but I want to say in the last month it's been awesome. <laughs> it has been awesome. But we've had some really bad experiences where, you know, people have broken into our building. I was unaware of it. I'm sitting in my office and they're upstairs and they've got weapons. So how do, how do we, how, how do I help my congregation to not be afraid? You say you're not afraid, but some days it's pretty fearful. So if you have ideas for that, we're, we're open. You know, we, we want to work together. Yeah, uh, as, as do we. I mean, the, the men and women of the police department are there to serve this community. That's why they took the job. Um, and uh, certainly, if, if, if somebody threatens you with a knife or makes explicit threats about, about harming others, that's a priority one and, and should get a response when that happens. Um, and I'm sorry if that's not the case, and I'd love to look into that for you if you want to give me the sort of time frame and a date, and we can try to figure out what happened there, because that's not right and it's a disconnect. With regard to your other question around the idea of uh, what is the way that we don't feel fearful. I wish I had a better answer. I, I don't know how to get that kind of answer. I think that there is some element to it that is mindset. I think there is some element to it that is uh, a, a sort of uh, a, a zeitgeisty consensus among the, the people that live in a community. Um, but I also recognize that it's 
dangerous to say just just bull along and feel safe because at times your people aren't. I mean, we do have harms in this community. We do have dangerous people in this community. We have had incidents in which people are hurt. And so uh, I, I don't have a clear answer on that. I think that the way that we can make it, the, the best way that I know uh, as a police officer is to have a, an empowered community that knows that there's someone on the other end of the line to respond if they need that help. Um, and that the, there's a recognition uh, that there is a, a, a balance between being able to handle things on your own and also knowing that someone is there to backstop that if, if you realize you can't. Um, I think one of the challenges that, that many communities have is that the stronger communities and, and you know, a lot, a lot of times that's drawn along uh, issues of density or wealth or other things, handle certain things on their own. Like it's, it, if, 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 if your community knows itself and also knows the other people in it and already feels safe, it's a much easier issue to be able to say to the young would-be hooligans who are, who are causing a ruckus on a stoop, you know, knock it off. I know your mother, I know your father, or I, I'll just knock it off. I don't even need that. And, and there's a certain amount of obedience and acquiescence and agreement. Oh yeah, sorry about that, I won't. In a place where that's not, possible or where people are more likely to be endangered or where folks don't know one another or where the, 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 the things that keep us together are already starting to slip, that can be a dangerous prospect and certainly a fearful one to try to, to say to somebody, don't do this. And it, it is a challenge. It's a big challenge. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that we've seen is that in some places we have gone so far in the direction of don't do anything as, as individuals and citizens and sometimes as, as businesses or, or, or policy oriented, don't do anything because it might create some amount of, uh, of risk or disorder, that we've actually encouraged more of it. Uh, but I'm not advocating for vigilantism or, or anything like that. In fact, I think that in times we're at risk of it. I don't think it's a good idea. So. I had uh, a lot, sorry guy, I had a lot that I, I was thinking of. And in the last, few com the last few comments that have come up, I'm thinking of even more. But I'll just gonna boil it down to one thing. We need to do this again and soon, and we need to probably do something like this regularly. I don't wanna put more on Chief Murad's plate. But I'm imagining that the number of people that are in this room, and I know several of you, uh, know a lot more today than you knew an hour ago. And I'm not gonna put that as a fault to anyone, because we have some city councilors here. I will be talking to my Ward 3 councilor. Uh, <laughs> but this was, and I went, I did six weeks in the winter at the Community Academy at BPD. And I know 500% more today than I learned in those six weeks. So let's do this again. Nothing wrong with the six weeks, but thank you, Chief. This is really good. Hello, Chief Murad. I'm Carol Cass. I've sent you plenty of emails throughout the years, <laughs> and it's nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Yes. Thank you. And I see uh, other people that I've written to here. Um, I just want to say that I grew up in Queens. I've worked in Manhattan. I've never been a victim of a crime. Since living here, I've had my catalytic converter stolen. Um, my car was broken into. We live in a community here, a few of us. Um, I'm also on our condo board. And the onus is always put on the people that are doing the right things. We had to spend $120,000 to enclose our garage. We had to put in security cameras. And it just seems to me um, that it's never put on anyone else that's causing the problems. It's always put on the people that are doing the right things. We have to spend the money. We have to get the cameras. I also work on Church Street. You know I send pictures all the time. Um, people doing drugs. We have to remove people every single day. The solution is 
Maybe you should put cameras outside. Maybe you should put a gate outside. That's not acceptable anymore. However, um, when, you, when you showed in your um, pictures here that you don't have enough police support, last weekend was very frustrating. I work on the weekend, and there was a parade going on Church Street. There were two police cars, one in the front and one in the back, escorting the demonstrators. Meanwhile, our friend who was mugged a few weeks ago or a f could not get any police help. When I call for help, no one shows up. But the police were out on Church Street in police cars. I filmed it because it was very frustrating to us. So what do we, who decides how this happens? I think those officers uh, were there on overtime. Uh, it was an overtime deal uh, to, to actually escort that uh, event. So they weren't on the regular clock and they weren't taken away from what they otherwise would have been doing. But we're paying them for overtime. No, no, overtime paid for by that entity doing the demonstration. So they were hired. 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 They were hired. Yeah. OK. Um, but why is it always put on the good people that are doing all the right things? Our taxes just went up. Our condo association has to foot the bills for all this stuff. Why don't we just figure out how to take care of the people that are causing the problems? I, I, I can't. Seems very simple. I can't disagree with that. I do think that we have uh, taken such a, uh, an effort to prioritize um, keeping people out of jail uh, at the expense of, uh, of the community. And I think the price of it is, is the parlous conditions in which the people who don't go to jail live in, which isn't good for them, and the parlous conditions in which we have to exist uh, as a community. Uh, and I don't think that any of those things make a lot of sense right now. I'm sorry, this is gonna be a little bit emotional for me. I'm a neighbor of the Methodist Church. I have two small children, they're four and one. And um, I do not feel safe. <laughs> um, I feel really, really unsafe. I am not able to walk down the street with my kids anymore um, because the streets are full of needles. Um, the First Congregational Church has taken uh, up some cleanup, some Sharps cleanup recently. Um, I've been told by my uh, council people to use C-Click Fix. Um, you know, which is, as everyone knows, like, it's, it's actually really nice for things like um, some college kids threw the, their shoes over the utility lines, whatever. Um, you know, stuff does get done, but um, for chronic issues, like, it just feels like an insult to be told to use C-Click Fix um, when I'm watching uh, people shoot each other up in the neck um, on, my, on my corner. Um, and I think that, you know, the I really appreciate you being here. I really appreciate the presentation. And I think that, you know, building stronger communities through non-police efforts is really important too. One piece of the police now sort of missing from our neighborhood is that, you know, I know my neighbors. Um, we talk a lot more than we used to. Um, I do not call for noise complaints. I haven't called for a noise complaint in almost five years. I talk to my, you know, my neighbors are noisy. I talk to them. Um, so, like, you know, there have been some positive developments in that way, but, um, but overall, I can't explain the feeling of sort of, like, frustration and hopelessness when I call the VPD and I get this message that says, please don't call for these things. And I guess part of what I don't understand, because I can hear, I hear about, I, you know, I can understand the rational reasons why all this is happening, and, and you know, we, we look at the numbers and we look at everything. But I, I just am so surprised that there hasn't been a shift back toward the community that would, for example, even something as simple as that message that we all get being much more, instead of like, we are on a priority response, please use the website for these 30 fucking things that you were definitely calling about. Ooh. And like, I would really like it to be, hey, we know you're having, a, like, we know there are issues, like we want to help. We are on a priority staffing situation. We may not be able to respond this quickly to these kinds of things. Here are some options about what you can do. Like, these are, you know, like just 
something that feels more community facing and not sort of like turning your back. It, you know, I just, it, it's so, it, you know, it just feels so sad as a citizen who like supports, <laughs> who wants to support the whole community, who pays taxes um, and, and who just, you know, like I, I, I want to build those relationships. When I see the incredibly rare instance where I see a, uh, a, you know, a cop on the street and, you know, around the, the church situation, you know, I try to make an effort to go up there and say, hi, thank you. Um, would I have done that five years ago? No, probably not. I mean, I know that, so it's in on all of us to be building these relationships, but I just have to say that I don't understand the, like, that just every single person I talk to is like, yeah, I don't, I don't see how this is going to change. I don't, I don't see where this is going. Like, we can't hire the uh, assistant attorney general, whatever, you know, they're not going to prosecute, they're not going to jail, the courts won't blah, 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 the blood, and it's just like, in the meantime, you know, like, it just feels, you know, for those people who don't live really near it, they have no idea, um, you know, like, I talk, you know, I, I talk to plenty of people who are like, oh, yeah, Burlington feels safe, and I'm like, <laughs> like I don't know what you're talking about, yeah, come to my house, yeah. um, so I just, yeah, I just wanted to put that voice out there as, like, and and to just say that I think there are some small things like, how do you make that message be more community oriented? I mean, it, that message has been what, three years now that that message has been on? I don't know. Um, it has never changed. It lists like, <laughs> you know, all the things you can't call about. And so yeah, I stopped calling. It wasn't until last week when I was talking to one of my council people who said, no, you should call. You should really call. And if you feel like you're in danger, you should call 911. Like, you, they need, you need to be registering. There's no way that they can tell what the, what's happening if you're not calling. And I just, you know, so anyway, in the last week I've started calling again. But like, how do we make that message larger? And um, anyway, that's all I had to say. I didn't really have a question. Just talking. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. I, the, we do want people to call. I, I've never stopped wanting people to call. I've been clear that, that, that calling is frustrating for people when, when a response may not be forthcoming, but that the call is important because we have to know what's happening and where it's happening. I believe I've been very consistent about that and, and uh, can find, uh, have, never, have never stopped saying that. With regard to the outgoing message, we'll uh, look at that and figure out if there is a way to make it somewhat more uh, more pleasant in, a, in, a, in what amounts to a, a community-oriented way, a, a customer service kind of way, but uh, the truth is that there are things that we can't, uh, that we're not going to be able to respond to. It's just, that is the fact when there are half as many officers on patrol as there used to be. Um, that's not even counting the absence of the street crime team, which would have been in addition to those 52 officers on patrol. Uh, and uh, a call volume that is equal to or greater than it was back when there were 52 officers. So, um, and I, I, I understand your frustrations too. I, I try to be optimistic about it. I understand the notion that, you know, we're not, how are we going to do this? If there's not going to be a prosecution, if there's not going to be uh, an arrest, if there's not going to be a jail term, if there's not going to be this or that, uh, if there's no response in the first place. Um, and I, I can only try to keep doing what we can with what we've got. I, I believe in a, in a kind of optimism that isn't about a glass half full or glass half empty. I don't know how I would evaluate the city in this moment, but an optimism that says I understand the shape of the glass and what it can be, and the idea that we can fill it up eventually. And I, I do think that that is true. Um, if I were too Pollyanna-ish about my optimism, the officers wouldn't, wouldn't accept it. Uh, and would simply say, you know, you are you're whitewashing the situation and, and you're, you're failing to look at where we are, uh, and that wouldn't be effective either. Um, but I do think that we can get better. I think that we can rebuild, uh, but it's going to take time. And in the meantime, we're going to have the kinds of situations you're describing which feel like they are not hopeful.
Yeah, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Chief. Uh, that was a great presentation, and I wasn't sure if you would let somebody from out of town speak. And that's, I'm a person who hears from a lot of people who don't come downtown anymore because it, whether it's true or not, uh, they feel less safe. And I've talked with friends who have cars who've been broken into and robbed while they were downtown. So that that is out there. But I'm wondering, you know, I'm here because I'm running for lieutenant governor. And that's why, Chris, I need to know more about what's going on here. But I'd also like to ask you, um, is 87 enough? If you could get to that, it sounds to me like even if you were fully staffed up at 87, you still probably wouldn't have enough to do everything you would like to do. And the second question would be, um, we know that a lot of the violence and a lot of the problems come with the drug dealers. Is there more that the state can do to help you with dealing with the, with the influx of drugs and the drug dealers? So uh, with regard to the first, you know, I'm just trying to get us to, to 87 and where we're supposed to be right now. Um, and, uh, you know, when we began the year with 69 and we're going to be at 69 on Tuesday, uh, that is a, a high enough hill for me to climb at this time. I have talked about, you know, what I would envision uh, before and, and put it out there, but that's what I'm focused on right now is, is getting to that. Um, with regard to the state, you know, we have terrific partners at the state level. Uh, the state police are good partners. Um, we ha worked very closely with them a couple years ago uh, with regard to narcotics to try to get a hold of some of this stuff. We work really well with our other partners. We created, I, I helped co-create with the ATF, uh, the Chittenden County Gun Violence Task Force. We've gotten a handle on the unconscionable amount of gun violence that we saw in 2022. Um, it is uh, far lower uh, this year and was last year too. So we do work very well with those partners. Um, you know, with regard to the state, uh, the, uh, you know, I do, I think there are, are changes that, that I would like to see at a legislative level with regard to certain kinds of crime. I've been clear that I think we need a, a felony gra uh, statute for uh, reckless endangerment. Um, I think there are, are things that we could do around certain kinds of crime that we see in Chittenden County or in Burlington that a lot of other places don't. Uh, a gang assault statute, for example. Um, but uh, I, I feel that we get a lot of really good uh, partnership and, and support um, in my line of work from the state. Great. I'm glad to hear that. And it's really great that you guys as a community do this sort of thing and, and pull people together and, and give your citizens the opportunity to weigh in. So that's really wonderful to see. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for coming out and sharing your time.